I'm, as indicated here, a professor at uh, University of Texas, Austin. I guess more important, I have my PhD from Carnegie Mellon since half the audience is, and maybe Pierre, you're from Carnegie Mellon also. No, okay, well, a good, a good percentage of the audience is, uh, and if you put me in the crowd, then there are three Carnegie Mellon people versus two uh, foreigners of some sort. And uh, so the Carnegie Mellon thing, I guess, has benefited me by having a, an audience. So I'm gonna talk about AdWord and AdSense and some of the research we're doing at Carnegie, at, not at Carnegie Mellon, at uh, UT <laughs> on uh, these subjects. And I'll also mention a little about work that we're doing with one of the large advertisers of um, Google, one of the people that pay big money to Google and discuss you know, just briefly some of the issues that they face and how we're trying to work with them to enhance the value they get from Google. So that's um, the picture of things. Now let me start by mentioning that we're also customers of uh, Google. One way we try to figure out what's going on with Google is just to become customers and advertise our research centers. So we have the keyword research and electronic commerce, and we bid on that in terms of both AdWord and AdSense to see what's going on. And although I should say that the amount of money we spend is not really significantly <laughs> contributing to the revenue stream at Google, but it makes us uh, better understand what's going on. So here we have our website, uh, where we have all our papers on various topics. And we were one of the first to publish, I think we, we had the first book out on, on e-commerce. It was called Frontiers in Electronic Commerce, which is probably published in 1996. So it's a thick book of about 800 pages that discusses all sorts of issues in e-commerce and it's probably out of date, well, it's definitely out of date, it doesn't mention Google, so uh, it marks it as, uh, as uh, dated. So here's a kind of a picture of how we see things. We have Google in the center of the universe, because that's the way we look at things, that Google is for us, uh, an extremely innovative company, and then poses a challenge, almost like a mystery, to figure out how Google works. And um, so we pursue that mystery, and we'll try to show you how we have uh, figured out how AdWord works, and then we have some ideas on how AdSense could work always from the point of view of Google maximizing revenue. So we look at everything from Google's point of view because we want to un uncover the mystery and we're always viewing Google as an entity that maximizes revenue within the framework of what they're doing. So Google is in the middle and we have advertisers with AdWord and in a way AdWord and AdSense interact with advertisers and publishers. So Google, of course, is a publisher, and then it has this big network of publishers that it, uh, it uh, provides advertisers exposure. And we're going to, or I'm going to emphasize the idea of exposure rather than just focusing on the links on the Google page because I think that the idea of exposure is a more general idea, and Google is, well, it generates a lot of revenue now, or most of its revenue from the Google uh, pages, that over time when there's a greater interest uh, development in wireless, uh, today there's a big conference on Apple and wireless, 
the notion of the link as a focus of the ad may become less important. And it's just exposure and exposure in various contexts and various locations that in whatever environment you're in seem to make sense. So we have video, the question is where does the exposure get the greatest attention? On the wireless screen, where does the video, where does the attention span go? So these things have to be calibrated. And, um, you know, that's what we are, uh, we're looking at. So we are f focusing first on AdWord. I'll talk about AdWord and then go on to AdSense. So we had a paper in a journal, Decision Support Th Systems 2006, where we showed that Google's advertising model was far superior in terms of the auction structure to Yahoo. So we showed that Yahoo was defective in the uh, auction model. And uh, believing in our own research, I went and bought some Google stock. Actually, we had the results in, in late 2004. So um, it, it turned out over the years to be OK. And we have a much more elaborate paper coming out in information systems research. So that's a, uh, the leading journal in the information systems field. So the thing that Google has come up with in terms of auction theory is actually a new auction model. So in the, in the information systems research article, we describe a fundamentally new auction model that somehow Google has discovered. And that model has uh, much higher expected revenue generation, or let's say higher revenue generation than the traditional auction models. So it's very performance-based. So in, in Google, as you know, the advertisers pay based on clicks. So that's what is called in the, in the auction business unit price auctions. So they're very different than eBay auctions or other traditional auctions. So Google uses uh, information on the bidder's potential to generate revenues for uh, Google, and I'll show you how that uh, works and how we would adjust the bids to take account of the characteristics of the, uh, of the uh, bidder, the advertiser, both in terms of the ranking rules, because uh, Google has certain ranking rules. So you bid on a, on a keyword a certain amount of money, which is the amount you'll pay on the click. And that then is the basis for um, Google assigning you to a particular link on the Google site. But Google, as they say, adjusts your bid based on past performance or some other things. They're not explicit. And we have explicit ways that one would do it. And uh, so in terms of the theoretical model, we make it uh, clear. And uh, the auction, Google assigns advertisers to links or slots. And each advertiser can get one link in the uh, bidding system. And Google has something unusual, which is that each advertiser bids and they then are assigned to links as against bidding on each link. So there's some research that shows that that's equivalent, those two things are equivalent. So Google has in some way simplified the auction model and it doesn't deteriorate the revenue that auction uh, model generates. So it's a pretty good uh, way that they either guessed or worked it out mathematically, I don't know. But it turns out to be perfectly fine what Google does, and it, it makes a lot of sense. But um, you know, we had to figure it all out. Actually, uh, it's very complicated to 
to show that that's true. So it's kind of amazing that Google people know these things. So the way things are set up here, in the Google world, you have in a prominence of a link. So the first link or the first slot is the one that people think has the greatest attention. And then the next link and the next link. And uh, I, have, uh, I had a student at UT who now works for Google in Beijing who did her thesis on experimentation to show that this is actually true, that people look at the first link and then some go on to look at the second and third. So if you're an advertiser, you'd like to get to the first link. So we have a measure of the prominence of the first link, the second and the third. And then we have what we call the quality of the advertisement or the quality of the ad or the advertiser, which is the indication of how likely they are to generate more or less click-throughs. And we believe that Google estimates that based on past performance of the advertiser with respect to that link. And that's one basis for adjusting the bids. And then another um, parameter, or what's called an economics type, is the quality of the advertisement which is the information the advertiser knows on how likely they're going to get a sale from a click, so the conversion factor. So in terms of information, Google will have an idea on the, um, the quality of the um, advertisement. Um, and, um, and then they're, uh, well, on the potential for the advertiser to generate clicks. And then there's this quality level, which is probabilistically known by everybody. So uh, we have some mathematics here, but I'll just try to talk through the math. I, you people are probably not interested in the beauties of the mathematics. Uh, although uh, Aegon probably is interested in it, but uh, I'm not going to uh, talk that much at that level. So what we have is, in terms of the economic model, we have an auction model where there are various, there are two types of information that the bidder knows. One of the pieces of information Google estimates and the other is just known to the advertiser. And uh, then that creates a new kind of auction model with two types. So the slots or the links are sold through a weighted unit price auction. And the weights are the things that we suggest Google uses to adjust the bids based on your past performance. So in our model, which is, again, trying to model Google, Google would, would score a particular bid. So B is the bid. And W of theta is a kind of a score that Google would come up with that would adjust the bid based on your past performance. And then uh, the. Uh, after the scores are determined, again, based on your bid and your past performance, then you uh, would have an assignment to a particular link. So that's the way it would work. And then what we, I'm just saying here that what we do is we find waiting scheme, how the waiting schemes determine how advertisers with different click-through potential match in equilibrium. So what we're showing is that because of this weighting scheme, Google matches better the advertiser and the customer. So Google is really in the center between somebody who's going to buy a product, a customer or potential customer, and an advertiser. And Google matches these things 
much better than Yahoo did until Yahoo adopted or tried to adopt the Google auction model. So for years, Yahoo was mismatching advertisers with potential customers, which meant that potential customers, you know, who were interested in finding information out about products they wanted to buy were getting misled on the Yahoo site, while the Google site has a tightly match. And I think that's why Google just took off and just beat down uh, Yahoo because they had a, a faulty auction model. Basically, they just use a conventional auction model you'd find in a textbook. So, you know, it wasn't... Uh, And uh, also, Google adjusts minimum bids. So as an advertiser, is a minimum bid, and that minimum bid is adjusted by, again, your past performance. So if, you're, if you've got bad past performance, your minimum bid is raised. So it's kind of keeping out people who are not that really properly matched. You know, let's say you have a keyword Paris hotels and you want to advertise dog food, you know, with maybe the idea that somebody's going off to Paris in the last minute, they figure they got to get some dog food. So they buy some dog food from that link, but that link isn't generating much revenue for, for Google. I mean, only occasionally somebody remembers they got to get dog food before they take off for Paris. So what you want to get are the Paris hotels connected with the keyword. You want Paris Hotel advertising for the keyword. And that's this matching idea that really is underlying the Google auction model. So you want to match, but you're going to let people reveal the information that they have in this matching environment, meaning the advertisers really put forth the ads that are most relevant. If you knew all the information, then you could set it up as an operations research model using some integer programming optimization. But you can't do it that way. So um, Egon Balash couldn't step in here because you don't know the information. You need the economic ideas to get you the matching. So that's the... Um, So here are just some comments on the um, keyword. You know, if any of you have any questions, just uh, you know, fire away at some questions. So the last um, bullet here, you know, for you people interested in Google, is that we show that this revenue maximizing waiting scheme, which is what we're developing in the model and differential minimum bid policy can generate higher revenue than standard fixed payment auctions. So there's uh, auctions, let's say, from, from uh, eBay and things like that, but they're in a different class of auctions. So Google's auction model is a unique class of auctions, both first price and second price uh, that, that they have or could have and they generate higher expected revenue than if you were to use an eBay auction. So Google, in effect, has uncovered a new auction model, at least the way we model it. So, um, so there is some related literature. There was a paper in the American Economic Review which uh, looked at things from a totally different perspective, not from Google's perspective, but some perspective in economics like efficiency, which means you take account of social welfare, things like that, which we didn't think was you know, really a focus of Google. So we didn't bother to go in that direction. And they made various assumptions, which uh, uh, it didn't really, um, in our view, consistent with reality, but uh, they were successful in getting their paper in the top economics journal. So from an academic point of view, they uh, they get full marks, but uh, otherwise they left the 
field open to really look at it from the point of view of uh, Google's interest in maximizing revenue. And again, the, um, you know, we're summarizing our starting point is advertisers may have different potential to generate click-throughs, which is what the potential customer, the user of Google, is really saying we're interested in the information that you're providing on these links. You know, we'd like to pursue that. So the click-through really describes the interest of the customer and the, the satisfaction of the customer going to the Google website to find information with respect to that keyword. You know, people weren't clicking, it means they went and looked at the links and the links had particularly no relevance to what they were interested in. So it would be a big negative, I think, in the long run for Google, which is again what happened to Yahoo, that people said, hey, we're just not getting anything that's interesting here and you know, let's go to Google where we get systematically get relevant advertising. You know, so targeted advertising, which is really the key to this whole field, is the focus and great success of Google and I think a relative failure at Yahoo in the sense they went on for years with this uh, improper auction mechanism. So, you know, Google had a chance to run ahead of them. Now they're, you know, they have something which presumably is much better, but I, I don't know the details and we don't really look at uh, Yahoo. So one of the things that you see with the Google model is that Google is looking at advertisers in a dynamic sense. So it looks back in some way that I guess is a Google secret and sees what took place in the past. When this advertiser came and put, it on, put an ad on Google with respect to that keyword. And if they generated lots of interest by the customers or potential customers, the people coming to the Google site to find information and to find relevant products, then let's look at them as the kind of advertiser we want with respect to that keyword. So in effect, it's kind of a dynamic process, and we looked a little at the dynamic, dynamic process. Now, as I said, we've been looking at things from the point of view of the, of the advertiser and working with one of the large advertisers of Google and trying to understand you know, how things work from the advertiser's perspective. And again, um, Sarah Ye from uh, Google Beijing did experiments to see how people react to these various uh, links, the first, second, and third link, and how much search people do, which then gives an advertiser an idea on where they hope to place their ad, because not everybody, well, only one advertiser is going to get the top link, you know, then the next link and the next link. So it may make sense, depending on the situation, to put in a reasonably high bid, but not what you think is the highest, even with your adjustment from Google, because it may be the third link is pretty good in terms of the product you have and the amount of people are going to search. And you may be able, because the, some of the Google keywords become pretty expensive. You can get keywords at $25 or $50. When we bid, we're paying $0.50 because there's not a lot of competition among advertisers who are doing research in e-commerce, maybe some other universities, and you know they're not uh, spending money in that way, it's not a conventional thing for a university uh, research group to advertise on Google. But when you get to other things, then the prices go up. You know, if you look at, let's say, uh, asbestos ads, I think there we found a website that had 
the price, they collected price information of something like $250 a click. So there, if you are a lawyer with uh, these asbestos claims, you want to get people to come to your site, fill out the form, you send it into the collection place, and you send them their check, and you keep your share as the lawyer. So it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a, just a completely competitive business. The whole lawsuit's been settled. All you're going to do is facilitate people collecting their money from the asbestos suit. So it's, the key to your business is just getting more customers. So these, the, the, the winning top link would be, let's say, $250 because that's the, the whole basis for your business. It's a, you know, it's a nationwide or most likely a nationwide business and you know, what are you gonna do? There's no point in advertising a, in a local newspaper. So Google is it and uh, the bidding is then very aggressive. So we're trying to look at the issues of location and pricing and how I price my product, I might pri price my product lower if I go to the, and get the third, the third link. So there's a whole sort of broad strategy of, um, of issues. So one of the things that um, a advertiser is concerned with is how do they eventually get a customer to buy their product? Now, sometimes a customer, let's say for a laptop, their laptop just broke. So they want to replace it with another laptop. So they go to keyword laptop, and then they may refine that down. So there's a sequence of steps that a customer does. And so if you're looking at the data from an advertiser's point of view, they're collecting a whole sequence of data as people come to various websites that they have that are more and more specific. If, let's say, you're just thinking about getting a computer, then you start out computer, desktop, laptop, whatever. So there's a decision process underlying the customer's uh, process that the advertiser wants to understand and to place ads to move that customer in their direction. So they may get some clicks from a particular keyword, but get very little conversion because it's leading them to another related keyword that's more specific that eventually leads to something that converts. So the question for them or for us as working with them is how do you bid on keywords that don't seem to have much conversion for them, but they are in the sequence that leads to a keyword that converts. So I don't know if that makes sense to you that the advertiser has a more complex challenge than just bidding on a keyword because they want to understand the decision process. And they have classes of customers, people who just want to replace a laptop or you know, some other particular component versus somebody thinking, let's go and get a computer for my uh, kid or grandkid and let's just start there and just go through and figure out what we're looking for. And they're going through a whole decision process. So I don't know if you have any comments on, you, you mentioned your interest from the advertiser's point of view. Yeah, the, you know, the advertiser we work with, they're saying, you know, look, we're spending huge amounts of money on, on Google. We've got to figure out how to you know, increase the uh, value from that if we can. You know, they also have channel conflicts, meaning that they're selling products through not only themselves and their online site, but through channels. 
So they would like to get as many products sold, but they would prefer in the end that somebody buys it from their site rather than from a channel, within reason, because again, if the channel stuff dries up, they'll lose channel partners. And you know, so in certain keywords, they're bidding against their channel partners, you know, which is hard to say they're competitors in some sense, but they're, they're partners. I think they would ref yeah. prefer the term partners. So you know, how do they handle that where they're just spending a lot of money competing with their, uh, with their partners? Yeah. And you know, in some sense, get, Google is benefiting from the competition. So I don't know if you run into that where you Yeah, 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 but uh, so, okay, so we indicate that, you know, we want to model that uh, process. Um, so let me just talk a little about uh, AdSense. Um, so the, the, uh, the AdSense seems to us, while it's still relatively small, at least from we understand from the industry, in terms of revenue for Google, it potentially could be a huge growth in revenue because of the developments in, in other kinds of media, the, uh, the uh, YouTube, uh, where you have video, and you have to figure out the context of the uh, ad and the video. You have wireless growth where, again, the Google site may show up. It may show up in a different form. And then you've got all these worldwide sites. So here we really focus on exposure. So we're saying Google's going to sell exposure. And on AdSense, you can talk about as an advertiser, you can either go, you can go and really look at things in terms of exposure. You know, how much you're bidding for a certain amount of exposure, at least the way we, we see uh, AdSense. And so um, what we've done here is uh, we'll talk about exposure and uh, give some reasons why exposure of an ad is a more natural concept than a slot. So if we have lots of different publishers, including Google, you know, you don't want to be allocating the advertiser to the first slot on every site that has this kind of structure. And of course, lots of sites don't have this nice structure. So the exposure idea seems to be a good way of looking at it. So what I'm going to talk about now is an idea we have on how AdSense should work, where we're going to have people bidding on, on packages of exposure, what we call slices of the total amount of exposure that Google has in a certain period of time. And then we're going to show how to optimize. So we're introducing some optimization with respect to an auction model. So we have an optimization, and within that we have advertisers bidding for exposure with respect to a particular slice structure. And then we're going to look at how to vary the slice structure to maximize the total revenue for Google. So it's, a, um, it's the way we think Google would make more money if they're not doing it now, of course, we don't really know how they do it. So it's an idea for making money here in terms of AdSense. And it combines uh, both auctions and optimization. So the auction gives you an idea how people will pay for a particular slice of exposure. So let's say Google has 10,000 exposures in a certain period of time. The first package could be 500 exposures, the next one, 
300 and things like that, or it could be 5,000 exposures. So the package of exposures that people bid on could keep varying. And so if Google understood the demand for exposures, it could then figure out the optimal packaging. And that would be the way to make maximum revenue. So it's a exercise in what's called price discrimination, second degree price discrimination, with respect to an underlying auction model. So it combines two things in economic, auctions and price discrimination, to come up with a, um, a, uh, come up with a uh, way of really making lots of money. So here, and this is one thing which is unclear to us, I don't know if anybody has any ideas on it, an auctioneer, say Google, has a total amount of resource, which you just call it one, we just normalize the one, it could be 10,000 exposures. And then it's going to come up with a share structure, which will be a package of exposures. So the first package will have the largest number of exposures, the next package, the, the next largest, and so forth. And they sum to one, which is just this total, or it could sum to 10,000 if we didn't, we didn't scale it. So just a scaling factor. So the thing that's really unclear to us is that the total exposures in a certain period of time is not really fixed. I mean, it keeps varying. So then how does Google handle that? That is, does it say, OK, we only got 8,000 exposures. For the first, as the exposures come in, we first give them to the top slice, S1. So we fill up that slice, and then we go to the next slice. So do you have any idea how they do it? There's a lot of queries, so I can imagine a lot of it is randomized. Yeah, we have this randomness, but then you have to allocate. I don't know, Pierre, are you knowledgeable in this area? No. Pardon me? I know I don't have much specific knowledge this. Yeah, so, it's, uh, so we're just assuming that it's fixed. The number is known, but there must be a way of dealing with this uncertainty in any small period of time. You just have a rule that you allocate in some way. Let's say we see the exposures coming in at a lower rate than we anticipate, so we proportionally reduce. In each, each slice, we proportionally reduce the number of exposures. Yeah, over time it could work out, but uh, you know, then there may be some advertisers are more keen on getting a, a precise number. They have, let's say, a marketing campaign. So if they're getting a slice that has, say, 3,000 exposures, they want to get pretty close to that. So they're willing to pay more money to get more assurance, so sort of risk-averse kind of idea. And while some other people say, well, we'll take a lower slice, and we'll pay a lot less. And if there's anything, any exposures, we'll grab them. If not, well, what the hell? You know, like we as academic advertisers, we could get a low price. And if there are any exposures left over, we take it. And if not, well, we didn't pay much anyway. And you know, it's not, it's not the end of the world if we're not, we're not exposed on uh, Google. It's a fixed number in our model, but I'm saying it really shouldn't be. Is it really that S sub J wants to have more than S sub J plus 1? So it, it's right. sort of bidding for 3,000 exposures. It, it bids for twice as many exposures as the next level. And then as long as the ratio is maintained. Well, that would be another way of doing it. That would be another way of doing it. So that would be kind of an equal scaling back. Versus, no one, no one really knows how many clicks or how many exposures will be just exposures, right? Time. Right. It's just that that whenever it is generated, you need to maintain the ratio between the different levels yeah. of quality or, or exposure. Mm. I have a more general question. 
I guess I'm not that familiar with the Google products. Um, which ones are based on click-throughs and which ones are, would be based on pushers? Well, see, as an advertiser, you're interested in okay. getting a customer who will buy a product. So ultimately, you want what's called conversion, okay. meaning that the customer clicks, they, they see the ad, mm -hmm. they click on it, think about it, and then they, you know, the next thing you see is a credit card. So that's what they want. The advertiser wants business. So the question is, how do you get business? Well, you start out with exposure, and then that can be often correlated with a click. So in terms of Google, they're willing to let you talk about exposure or click because they could be you know, highly correlated. And then the advertiser itself or themselves they see the conversion. Google doesn't generally know how many people pull their credit card out and buy the product. That's the advertiser's knowledge. So in the end, the advertiser got to see business from this process. But at the Google level, you could have exposure or click-through. As long as they're correlated, you can go back and forth between the two. Is that a reasonable? Yeah. Thing to monetize, I guess. But you can say that we've given you exposure, meaning, you know, 30 seconds on YouTube in right. a certain context. Right. We, we can, we, Google can measure how much we've given, but it's hard for us to rank the quality, I guess, in your metric. Uh, yeah. Because we don't know, right? If, somebody, if nobody's clicked on it, we don't know what makes a good ad and what makes it right. bad. Right, right. But, and, and so, again, this theory we can develop in terms of clicks, we just, when you when you go to AdSense, they talk about exposures and clicks. Right. So. Yeah, well, I mean, right, Google can track both, but if if all you did was was just counted how many exposures, I don't know if there's a way to get feedback to Google on yeah on, on essentially the quality of the ads. You know, if that's going into your formula. Yeah, so we could just use exposure uh, at a click through in AdSense. Right. But also. You know, for, for something like uh, you know buy buy a soft drink. Yeah, so there you don't even you don't get the uh, conversion, but of course. Right, so that's branding kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but then when you go on the wireless, you know, and then. Yeah, then or you know a, a vending machine, Google's going to have it in the wireless location. will say, well, the next you know walk thirty feet, take a left turn, knock on a door. And uh, you'll get your uh, yep. your can of Coke, Coca Cola. I mean, <laughs> so uh, you know the location thing. You know, really, again, is a whole new world, yeah. which you know will have, I think, fantastic implications for revenue generation in uh, in uh, this uh, Google world. But you know, we're. You know, for us, it's just a word, click or exposure. We could talk about clicks or packaging clicks or packaging exposure. Okay. So it's, uh, but the problem is that, um, well, we could just use, uh, use, uh, so the advertisers just bid on their willingness to pay for uh, a particular slice. And again, you know, you just have this allocation of slices. Here I just have some uh, mathematics that uh, what it's really saying is that you can look at the advertiser's expected revenue based on their bid. So here V hat is a, um, is the, the, basically the second price of the bid. So what it's saying is that the expected payoff from an advertiser is that expression where they have a certain value and they put in a certain bid. And then the auctioneer's revenue is this. And so what we're able to do then, if we have 
an idea of the bidding functions and the auction, you know, we can then um, determine the optimal slices. So the idea is to slice things up in packages that generate the maximum revenue for people. So you may have a lot of advertisers who want to have big slices. So you have quite a few big slices and you charge high prices for it. Or you have some lots of the advertisers just want small slices. And so you just go in that direction. And so depending, it's like an airline, you see a lot of people coming who, let's say, they look pretty wealthy and they want to go to Middle East somewhere. So you reconfigure the plane so you have lots of first class seats. You generate more profit that way. So it's the same thing here. It's just a form of price discrimination. A lot of people come in and they're going to bid on, on big slices. They're, you know, heavy hitters. Then you just make as many big slices as possible and you really ramp up the price as you would in an airline. You know, you start charging $25,000 for a first class seat because that's what people want. Or vice versa, you know, people flying to other places in the world where it's not so affluent. So, so this is the basic idea that we're proposing, is using price discrimination to, to package things together. And here we're just going into some mathematical um, issues on um, how to compute these um, slices, the so-called monotone hazard rate in terms of the auction model. So I'm going to just skip through this, plus you know I'm running out of my uh, a lot of time. One of the things that you find is that you have these different slices, and some slices may be the same size, but you're just going to still charge people more money for the same slice in terms of this price discrimination, because they they were bidding higher, they were more anxious. So we have these first class seats, and we put them up for bid, and people are going to pay their bid. So somebody says, you know, I'm not going to, I got to be in wherever, and I got to be in a first class seat. So they bid tremendous amount, you just take their money, and there's still other people bidding for first class seats for the same product, but they're bidding less, and you still have first class seats, so you let them sit in the first class seat. So basically, you're extracting as much revenue as you can from everybody. And that's you know, the economic model here that we show, that you can have the same, the same resource, but people are going to pay more or less money for it. So you group these common slices together. And of course, in a plane, you'd have you know, first class seat, and then you'd have business class seat, and you know, premium economy plus. So you have all these different groupings of seats to extract the, the revenue uh, from people. So this is the idea of price discrimination. You squeeze the customer because you're getting from the bidding their uh, excitement about getting their hands on that product. So you, you leave as little amount of money on the table as possible by the price discrimination method. So we, we study a lot of different ways of squeezing the customer. That, uh, and, and I mean, this is not just us, but other economists do that too. So this is just more discussion of this whole squeezing business. No, this is a, a business term, isn't it? Uh, you you want to squeeze your uh, your advertisers, you know, get as much money as you can from them. Isn't that the idea here? Yeah. You better be careful. This is going to be on YouTube. So. <laughs> yeah, but if but if people are very happy, you want to make sure that they leave amount of money that reflects their happiness with you.
yeah, I mean, they could learn that uh, happiness can be achieved with bidding less, but again, they don't know who's going to be bidding against them again, so they take their chances on that. So this is all sorts of mathematical features of this, uh, of these uh, issues uh, here. Okay, so you know the main result here is that depending on the demand function, you're going to have different slice structures, as you would expect. You know, as I illustrated with the discussion of the, of the plane and filling up the plane and maximizing revenue, which of course is a big thing for the airlines now given they have this huge fixed cost of, uh, of fueling up the plane. They have to squeeze everything and you, and you have that feeling when you go on a plane. They are squeezing you for all the revenue they can get their hands on. So, you know, this is the same idea <laughs> in a way that what we're talking about here is just uh, making sure that all the money you can get is, uh, and this uh, literature in economics on discriminatory pricing and uniform price auctions, and um, so here are just some conclusions um, that we have. Um, so we're just trying to identify the issues that would lead to the proper allocation of these slices or collections of, uh, of exposures or click-throughs that you're going to offer across the, the um, Google AdSense network. And uh, the structure depends on the demand function in various ways that are are mentioned here, depending on the structure and, or what you, what we, what you would call price elasticity, the price versus the number of people are willing to pay for exposure or clicks. As that varies, you're going to have different uh, structure. So we say here, the advertiser's price is elasticity of demand for exposure. So the, you know, the just discussion things are, that we have, you know, what's the future direction in terms of uh, auctions on slots or exposure as we move into this wireless world. Google is ambiguous in their auction. They don't specify precisely how things work. So on eBay, you know exactly how it works. So we're trying to figure out what you would call uh, the effect of ambiguity in the auction on the revenue generation. So it's again a research topic of why Google has ambiguity. And presumably, since everything else that Google does generates more revenue, presumably it's a way of generating more revenue. So it's a research topic for us. And then I mentioned this, uh, this uncertainty of the volume of traffic in uh, you know in the in the Google network, I mean it's just not clear how much traffic you're getting for a particular context. So the click-throughs, the exposures would vary. You know suddenly, you know the massive denial of service attack across the world. The click-throughs, the exposures for, for a particular context would would fall dramatically. So how that's handled, you know I don't know. And then we've looked at this area of advertising exchange, you know, because uh, Google has bought DoubleClick, and we can't seem to figure out how these things fit together. Do you know how they fit together? Yeah, but see, it seems like you have all this potential, but you have one way of doing it, which is the auction models, where you know Google is managing all these sites. It's sort of a one-sided market, and then you allow advertisers to exchange. So they seem like they're not totally in harmony. 
I have, the, I have a two-sided market and I have a one-sided market, right. and they're both operating. Yeah. Well, and how do they fit together? I, I believe we'll keep them somewhat separate. Because yeah. Images are measured in one bucket, text is measured in another bucket. And so if you know you're bidding on an image, you know, you, want to, you know that there's nothing you're competing with. And so there's, if we start switching, Yeah, but then how does a advertiser decide whether they want to go to the ad exchange? Right. And I'm not sure what they're exchanging there. They're exchanging locations? Uh, I don't know. I, I know people can just, uh, with the AdSense type of mechanism, it seems like you can do an image version of that as well. Mm. Just, hey, put something here. But you're going to kind of complain if it's your competitor that's advertising in your site. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems not clear. And, you know, we've asked the people we work with and they're not clear. Yeah, well, it's still a research project here probably as well. Oh, it is? I, I don't know. I okay. Imagine. Okay, well, are there any other points worth discussing? We could go back offline and discuss Carnegie Mellon. I could tell you more stories about the good old days of Carnegie Mellon before it was called Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do have a question about strategic ambiguity. Like, I'm just thinking we can look at it both, from both ways. You know, we can look at strategic ambi uh, ambiguity from the point of bidders versus um, auction designers. And we could also look at ambiguity from your auction designer versus other auction designers out there, let's say Yahoo or others. So yeah. I guess that's, that's a question I, I face right now. Yeah, and, and I think it's a good point. The, so we, we tend to take the point of view of Google, meaning we know that Google wants to maximize revenue. They're, they're a profit-maximizing company. So they seem to do everything from that point of view as we can see it. So we're sort of asking the first question, if I want to maximize my revenue as an advertiser, as a as a as a um, auctioneer, yeah. then do I make things precise, or do I leave some ambiguity? For example, Google doesn't precisely specify how it makes these adjustments. You know how much it uses past behavior, how it uses past behavior in terms of click through, but they must have some formula because it's, Google is all automated. As I understand, I mean, there's nobody sitting there adjusting things. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you'd have to have a million people. Uh, you'd solve the unemployment problem in the U.S. Hiring all these people, and making adjustments on every keyword. So it's presumably all automated. And uh, so there are formulas there that they they're using to automate the process, but the formulas aren't made public, which would then allow a advertiser to figure out how to do things it's like your frequent flyer points. You know, it's really discounts for the future passed on based on on what you've done in the past. So you're buying stuff from American or whatever, and you're getting these points, but you know explicitly you look on the table, although there is ambiguity on whether you can actually buy something with those points. So there really is ambiguity with the points as well because you don't know what they're worth. So I guess when you look around, you see ambiguity because it's not a commitment. When I get, say, 20,000 miles, it's not a commitment that I can get a you know, round-trip ticket to uh, New York or something like that. It just says you can give it a try. And maybe the only thing you can do is get a ticket to you know, somewhere in uh, Kansas City or something like that, even though you want to go to New York. So the whole thing is not clear, I guess, is the point, and which maybe is done for lots of reasons. But it's an interesting open research topic to understand why eBay is very explicit 
and why Google has this ambiguity. So we call it strategic in the sense that it's done with some purpose in mind, but maybe maybe it isn't. Maybe just that's the way it is, and nobody bothered to say, let's make it explicit. Well, you know, eBay is a, is a different model. I mean, there's lots of people come in. They may not go to a particular eBay auction. They may, it's very diffused eBay. You know, people are looking for a rocking chair. They get it, and the next time they want to buy a laptop. But eBay just has a standard second price auction. So eBay didn't innovate in auction, and Yahoo was using a kind of a second price auction. They didn't. So, so a, a disadvantage of an eBay is there's there's a, it's it's chaotic. I guess it's not a steady state because somebody may wait until the last minute. And oh yeah. The just, I mean, bid just a tiny bit more than whoever did last. Right. Uh, that that's pretty awkward to do in any kind of steady state. Right. Uh, so you want to come up with a way where people tell the truth. People say this is how much I'm willing to pay. I mean it, and then I'll just let you yeah. do the right thing with the information. Well, actually, uh, we have examples where the Google auction doesn't give you truthful, necessarily truthful bidding. Mm -hmm. You could be strategic. You could figure out what to do. While on eBay, in theory, because it's a second price auction, it should be, you should be bidding at some point your value. Right, because it's sequential. Right. It's sequential. The, the, the Google auction is a sealed bid. I mean, you just right. put in your bid and that's it. Yep. And eBay, there's this sequential but, but process. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the, the exact, the description for the different, different kind of auction. But, but with Google, just because you say what you're willing to pay doesn't mean Google's going to charge that people. We could, but then they're not going to come back, right? They're going to they're start coming back with lower bids and lower bids. Well, the, the, you know, Google, you do adjust. I mean, on your site, you do adjust the bid, and you'll be adjusted up if you've been a good customer. I don't so, know that's no, but that's that's that that's what it says on the website, okay. and so we have it built into the model, and we show that that's a key to increasing revenue. Yeah, well, it makes sense. The, the ads that are more likely to get clicked-throughs means Google will get more money for showing sure. right. Right, which also means that the people who are coming to the site looking for relevant ads will be disappointed. It's better for a customer if they're seeing relevant ads. Right, and that's the idea of the matching, that Google has this very powerful matching. Right, and I don't know how that's going to work with images. If somebody's just looking, they're not looking. Well, you'll have to calibrate where the position of the image is in terms yeah. of the prime spot and the next prime spot, which means that you know, this, I mentioned this work of Sarah, yeah, when she was doing just the straight, the Google site. So people, presumably at Google or other places, will have to calibrate the uh, location on a wireless device or uh, images like on, um, on YouTube where people's eyes go to first with respect to the kind of presentation you have. So that's, you know, a whole challenge for Google and for the advertisers who want to make money off of Google. And of course, for Google to survive, the advertisers have to make money. So, but, you know, the old way of advertising, this lack of targeted advertising is, of course, causing the shift of money to the Google even with the economy in a slow period now, the Google presumably is still getting more business while the traditional advertising places, newspapers and magazines, they're, you know, they're really having trouble. Yeah, well, if we can reduce the number of ads someone has to run to get their customers, you know, they're, well, they're better off, we're better off. Right, right, and that's the targeting. I mean, you're, you're showing ads to people who are really interested in getting a product so they're not going to use a, a TiVo on Google 
they're going to Google because they're thinking of buying a tennis racket, and that's the ads they want. You know, versus watching a TV program where you know you have no interest in tennis and they're just constantly placing ads on tennis rackets. So I mean, they try to connect these things, but it's you know it's a mass audience, and so they can't do it that well. So I guess uh, seem to be at the end. So, thank you. well, thanks for coming and uh, showing the the school. Yeah. Uh,